Hello, and welcome to Dig It. I'm Peter Brown, and hosting the show with me today is Chris Day. Hi, Chris. Hi, Peter. Vines have been grown in England since Roman times for winemaking. The Doomsday Book refers to over 42 vineyards in southern England at the end of the 11th century, and now there's nearly 1,000 individual vineyards across the British Isles. Interestingly, the largest 100 producers control around 75% of the UK's wine production. Welcome to Dig It, Tim. You're obviously a very good friend of the Garden Centre, and we've followed your journey into grape growing over the years. Uh, wh- where do we find you today? This afternoon, I'm sat just in front of our vineyard at Gorecott. Brilliant. So just so people know, Gorecott, little mm. village, North mm. Buckinghamshire, and yeah, it's a lovely site, isn't it? And, yeah. uh, it's sun's shining, you must be having a nice afternoon down there, Tim. Welcome to the show. Yes, the sun, the sun, the, the sun is very welcome, it's lovely, and we have not seen very much of it in the last <laughs> few, well, few weeks. No, we haven't. Tim, obviously you're a good friend of the Garden Centre, and we followed your journey, great growing over the years. Um, But you've not always been into, uh, you've not always been a wine grower, Tim. How did your journey begin? Okay, so I was um, brought up in a little village near Scunthorpe, went to school in Scunthorpe, um, did my A-levels and then went off to London to do a degree in environmental science Mm -hmm. uh, before it became a thing. This is in the late 80s. And while I was there, I had a couple of sort of um, summer holiday sort of jobs. Uh, I used to be a furnish wrecker at Scunthorpe Steelworks. Okay. So that was uh, that's what we did. Uh, that's what we did during the summer. And then uh, my my other little thing that I did uh, was I managed to get myself into a film. It was a film with Milner Griffiths and Michael Douglas, and I was a, an extra back back in the early 90s, whatever it was. So that's, that's how it all started. Uh, post that, I went to work in London, uh, working for big American uh, computer companies, mm-hmm. and then just prior to setting up the thing out here at Gorecourt um, for a few years, I kind of worked for myself in IT, um, and uh, and that's it. So mm. when you um, yeah when you um, when you list it out, it doesn't actually sound like a lot really. Not had that many jobs or did that many different things. I don't know. We're working on working on film film, film star. star. Yeah. We've never had a film no, star on the no. podcast. I don't think yet. We've had a <laughs> yeah, few think, television think... celebrities, but <laughs> <laughs> star, star is pushing it. I, I <laughs> Oh, it's not, yeah. Brilliant, nice good stuff. So uh, uh, you got bored with IT and um, moved into growing plants. And uh, had you had much experience of growing things before, or was it just because you liked a glass of wine and you thought, "Let's see if we can become a, a vineyard owner"? I mean, what, what, what started the passion yeah. with wine? So you've got it. You've got it. Uh, you got it right there. Um, the, <laughs> the, push, the push away was the fact that I was fed up with what I was doing, um, had enough of it, and the pull towards it was the fact that uh, I just like wine. Um, okay. And um, but but we did have the site here at Gorecourt, so that was here, and therefore made it relatively straightforward. We we, we had a bit of land looking for a project, and yeah, it was that desire to mm. um, do something more interested with my life do something m- much more fulfilling and um wine uh, wine wine was it because of the passion for drinking wine <laughs> fantastic well, great. Simple as that. Yeah. yeah so that's why it tastes so so nice is it your wine because uh, you, it, well I, i've certainly had a few bottles of yours and it is lovely wine i mean mm. it really does fantastic yeah so, uh, hit the back of the throat well it's nice yeah. it's, it's yeah. a good wine <laughs> so, so yeah, Tim... well hope the passion hope the passion comes through oh well most definitely yes yeah so tim can you tell us a little bit about the site i mean terroir isn't that the that's the proper name for the soil isn't it french word yep um absolutely yeah so here we are on jurassic limestone which is our bedrock and then the the top soil the field is classified as sand and gravel but it it, it massively um varies and grades across the site so on the preston biscuit side it's like coarse grain sand with riverbed pebbles and then the further you get towards Gorecourt, we start to pick up a bit more 
well, a lot more flint and a little bit of uh, clay. It gets the, the soil gets a little bit heavier. But there's no there's no defining lines. It, it's just one of those things where it kind of just uh, it just changes little by little um, as you go from like the first row to the to the last row. So we've got quite varied, interesting, complex soil, which hopefully in the um, in the long term, because it's all about the roots as the roots get bigger and deeper will just result in some um, nice, interesting, complex wine. Mm, that's interesting. So can, can you remember, Tim, when when and where you, you planted your first grapevine? Can you take us back there? Well, it was, yeah, it was here. Mm-hmm. Um, at Gorkot, I pl- we planted a couple, a few, just a few um, trial ones in 2008, mm-hmm. and then it was um, all, all or nothing. Um, the chunk of the vineyard was planted then the following spring in uh, may 2009 so okay. yeah that that was it that's how it worked how many just matter how many uh, vines actually went in did, did that first planting was um around about five thousand. oh wow okay big numbers Gosh. Yeah. How, how many acres yeah. have you got down there tim well in total now because we planted some more in 2018 right um we've got just over eight acres you can get them in quite close together yep. then. Yeah, wow. That's a lot of vines, isn't it? Yeah. That's a, yeah, interesting. Yeah, mm. that's, that's yeah, a it's point. a very long hedge. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very productive long hedge, yes. <laughs> and when you planted them, I mean, so you had a trial year, have you got multiple varieties or is it just one variety? We've got four different varieties. The Our intention was and still is uh, that we would make sparkling wine. And the classic varieties for that are Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Pinot Meunier. Um, right. So that went in. And favourite wine, personal favourite, was Bacchus. So we also planted Bacchus. And that, and it's as simple as that. That's what we've still got here at Gorkot. Excellent. Because yeah, Bacchus is certainly one of yep. the more common English wines that you see, isn't it? And uh, I'm guessing yeah. it does... I mean, it's a lovely tasting wine. It but certainly is, it, yes. I, I'm guessing it, it's a vine that grows well in this country. How do the Chardonnay and the uh, other two varieties you mentioned do? Are they are, Do they do well in our climates? Or Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, certainly um, where, where we are, I know there's some vineyards quite a bit further north now, um, up, in, up as far as North Yorkshire, and I think they would struggle up there. But here... On uh, you know, on an annual basis, they 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 all do pretty well. Um, okay, that's we, good. Mm. Yeah, we 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 get good results from from all of them. Tim, can I just ask you um, this 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 year's weather? Obviously, uh, it's been a bit of a nightmare for for gardeners. Has it yeah. been a, a problem f- for yourselves, or is it is it is it looking like it's going to be a, a good harvest this year? Yeah, well. Um, we started off okay. Uh, we had no frost, which was uh, good news. We got into flowering um, probably at the end of June when the yes. weather changed. Um, and uh, the, the June, June period was nice and warm, but July and into the beginning of August, we've had a lot of wet, cold and cloudy weather, um, which, as you probably would imagine, is not really the best for uh, growing grapes any, anywhere in the world, really. No. So, so yeah, we are just suffering a little bit from that at the moment, hoping that things will change. We've still got probably six weeks before we start to harvest. So, you know, a bit of nice weather now um, mm. might might make the world a difference. Sure, mm. yeah. Okay. But I suppose with lots of yeah. rain, you've had uh, the great, the, at least the, the grapes have a lot of water to suck up and there is available to them, or does that not really matter with vines? Because obviously... In certain places of the world, you see them growing on what looks like sort of rocky outcrops, and they yeah. still manage to get their grapes full of juice. Well, it it does it, it does, vines need water, um, but vines have got big root systems. A, okay. a, a vine root can be as deep as six meters. So, um, and our, all of our vines are pretty. Yeah, all of our vines now are pretty well established, and. Because we're in England, with big roots, they will always find water. My, you know, my view is that there's plenty of water down there, um, mm. and uh, I'm sure they will always find some. Well, even you know, last year when it was really hot, we had um, a couple of periods where it was like pushing 40 degrees, 
and um, they, there was no sign of water uh, or lack of water stress at all last year. Oh, that's interesting. Um, so that, yeah. that te- you know that, tell- that tells me that they're mm. down there and they're, and they're finding they're finding enough moisture. Mm, that's, that's interesting. And I mean. yeah. now all the all the grapes you're growing are white grapes, aren't they? Nope, what, no, what, no, what's no. the difference between a making when you're making wine between a, a, a red grape and a white grape with regards to the wine? Is it simply just a colour or? Yeah. So so just to just to correct you a little bit there. We, out of the four varieties that we're growing, um, Bacchus and Chardonnay are white. Right. Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier are red grapes. Okay, uh, right. There you go. Yeah, yeah, so we do have red right. grapes, but typi- typically with our, uh, with our red grapes, um, the main bit of production from them will be white wine, which right. is our white sparkling, mm. our white fizz. Um, so, yes, we grow red grapes. And very occasionally we might make, and you you have some on your shelf at the moment. We we might make a red wine out of our red grapes, but normally we're making either a white or a bit of rosé out 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 of the red grape. Oh, so so you, are you blending the the variety the variety or the, just the process of of the, the actual grape itself? Is it, so is the, it... The, the the white or the clear juice? Um, means that we could, we, well, in actual fact, also on your shelf at the Gan Centre, we, you've got a white Pinot Noir of ours, which is a white still wine made out of our red red grapes. So, yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, we do use blending, but the the process of turning a red grape into white wine is really more to do with the process rather than to do with the um, with with the blending. If that makes sense, I'm yeah. not sure if I'm making sense there. It's hard to explain when uh, what, you know when. Uh, when there's no prop in front of you. So, sorry, Tim. Uh, forgive my ignorance, but what yeah. is, is it to do with the? Do you leave the? Is it to do with you know, sort of leaving the skins on the wine or something like that that gives it the colour? Or is it? Uh, I mean, you talk. You yeah. talked about a process. Yep. Oh. All right. Yep. 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 So, so the thing about colour in a red grape is that all of that colour is in the skin. The juice is clear. Okay. So the trick is, if you can remove the um, the skins from the juice prior to fermentation, um, and you ferment and you ferment that clear juice, even though the grape started off as red, you end up with a white wine. Yeah. Ah, yeah, that's that's yeah. yeah. Right. And, okay. and, and really, the, the, the word to think about is the word time. So uh, with red grapes, if you have no time with skin contact, then you get a white wine. You have a very short time, you get a rosé, and if you have a very long time, i.e., the skins and the juice are present throughout the whole of fermentation, then you will have a red wine. Mm. Yeah. So, so the word to think is time. Time. Yeah. And with regards to the red grapes and the white grapes, do they all grow just as well in 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 sort of England, or are there particular varieties that? you find sort of grow better in in this area in their white wine other than the, the two pinots that you mentioned um i'm i'm guessing that there's probably around about 50 odd varieties grown in the uk really? um a mixture of red and white mm-hmm. but the secret would be to kind of stick to that list um there are lots of other varieties, maybe more famous, some of the more international French varieties, like, for example, Merlot, which is a red grape, or Cabernet Sauvignon, which is a, a red grape, or Sauvignon Blanc, white grape. Really, we cannot grow them in the UK, so mm. you, you're just better off not even uh, thinking about it. Um, you need to be 500 to 1,000 miles south, really, to do that successfully. <laughs> okay. Okay, brilliant. And, and then, and there's a whole long list of you know varieties that just really are. They would not be considered to be cool climate. You know, we we here in the UK have got a cool climate, yeah. um, and 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 that is what we should um, stick to. The Mediterranean varieties, without a dramatic change in the climate, just for, yeah, just don't even. I, my my view is just don't even think about it. <laughs> Okay. Um, do, do you think, yeah. Tim, that the whole idea of you know, global warming and climate change 
is going to change that sort of view in in the future. What's your what's your feelings to to, to that? Could 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 it? Well, my 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 observation on that, um, based on um, what what happens here at Gorecourt and watching the weather forecast, I guess, is that potentially um, with climate change and the future, it will make things easier in the UK. But that but that is if the um, average temperature increases during the summertime rather than the winter time. You know, mm. what we don't really want is warmer, wetter winters. No. What we what we need is warmer, drier summers. Um, mm. So it's all very well having an overall annual average temperature increase, but we really, I think that we need that during the growing season, not during the uh, dormant season. Yeah, yeah. Um, and less of the weather events, i.e., you know, all these weather records, mm. um, weather, individual weather events, we... As you probably did, had uh, quite a bit of hail one day in June, I think it was. Mm-hmm. Um, it was yes. like the heavens yeah. opened, and uh, you probably got it at the garden centre because we yeah. certainly had it here at Gorecott, we- and uh, and it yeah, it was mm. almost good. biblical um, yeah. with the hail bouncing bouncing all over the place. So yeah, yeah. So like I said, last year it was a good year. We've had lots and lots of good years in the last few years. But I, I don't think we've got enough evidence to suggest that it is a, a, a sure no. thing yet. That it's a, that it's a definite bet that um, it will be um, beneficial in the long term. No, oh, that's that's mm. interesting. I mean, I'm sure a lot of our that's listeners. That's my view. Anyway. Yeah, no, no. I think I think no. It's very plausible. I think as gardeners, we would like to see what you're sort of suggesting to happen. Yeah, a lot of these ex- extremes of weather, which is uh, which is about. Um, one, yeah. yeah. One thing on on your your wonderful uh, bottles and your 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 marketing and packaging is the is the stag logo. Um, where did that come from? The stag logo. Well, yeah. so um, of all the things that we had to do to create Chafer Wine Estate, the thing that I think I found probably the most challenging and difficult was the branding and coming up with uh, all of these sort of things. But eventually, what we did is we took like inspiration from several places. First of all, book, the Buckinghamshire Crest of Arms, which is a stag and a swan. Mm-hmm. So we picked, we, we picked up on the stag. Um, the second part of it is Burnwood Forest, which is the former Royal hunting ground. Um, so that is that, you know, that, that, that is associated with it as well. Yeah. And then last, well, Two more things, actually. Uh, but I guess next thing was to do with the fact that we have lots and lots and lots of deer who visit the vineyard on a regular basis. Um, we <laughs> almost have a resident herd of roe deer. They're here um, most of the time. And then we get the odd munt jack and uh, mm-hmm. even Chinese water deer. So they're, they're kind of our vineyard friends. Nice. Um, and then last of all, it, somebody said to me, if you put a furry animal on a bottle of wine, you've got more chance of selling it. <laughs> <laughs> really? That's interesting. That's so good all of those yeah. things together, yeah. it, it came, we, that's where the stags came from. You know, we just thought it was a really nice, no, um, nice. quintessentially English, yes. old world, old world sort sort of an image. Yep. And um, and that yeah, that 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 was it really. Brilliant, good stuff. And you say friendly deer. Are they they don't yes. cause too many issues in the vineyards. They don't they don't like eating vines. Well, potentially they do, um, and I do know that some people put up um, deer proof fencing. But we've not really had any problems. They seem to be more interested in our apple trees than uh, than the vines. <laughs> so we've, we we kind of have sacrificial apple trees um and they leave the vines yeah. alone yeah. but yeah we just like we just like to see them um we we live in Tin, we live in live in tinswick and we walk back um through the woods and across the fields and uh, you know just with the hope of um of, of, of seeing them out there in the fields really brilliant well i think you might see the same ones as we do because certainly this year Oh, at the top of the field in the garden centre here, I've seen quite a few yeah, deer. A and, more, yeah, more than uh, normal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they're, they're obviously doing well in this area, which is good to see. <laughs> they, they certainly are, yeah. Excellent. And yeah. back to wine. I mean, yeah, wine. I mean, wine. How do you create sparkling wine? Sparkling wine? So, um, it, I mean, step by step, I guess it is grow the grapes. 
you know, first thing we need is our raw material grapes. Um, and then the process really is that they are fermented, yeah. um, i.e. The, the sugar, the natural sugar that is in the juice is turned into alcohol and carbon dioxide. That, that, that gives us our base wine. Um, and the way that we do it is to make our sparkling wine, we will blend three varieties together, the Pinot Noir, Pinot Meunier and Chardonnay, but they are fermented separately. Oh, That's the important thing. Uh, we, we, we will blend before bottling and along, in, sorry, in the blend, we will add um, a little bit more yeast and a little bit more sugar because once we've bottled it, a second fermentation is going to happen inside that bottle ah. so that that's how we do it second fermentation in the bottle and then the important thing with the way that black and wine is produced in the uk it is that it has extensive aging so like the wine our current vintage our 2017 vintage has four years aging um, and that's called aging on the leaves so that, that, that that's the important thing that's what builds all the flavors so you know, it builds complexity and we are going to move away from the sort of fruit driven wine into uh, wine that is more bready, brioche, figgy, honey, baked apple. So all these all this happens over this very long period of time and then we have to remove the yeast, put the cork in, put 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 the uh, wire hood on, give it a shake, um and then we're 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 ready for sale. So yeah, yeah, it's very cool. very long, very involved, very complex mm. way of making sparkling wine. So lees, um, from my understanding, that that's like the dead yeast and all the stuff that falls out of the wine as it's maturing. Is that right? That's right. Excellent. That's it. Yeah, yeah. It's the, it's the yeast that performs the second fermentation. Um, it then it's 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 there. It stays in the bottle for the aging for the aging process, and it, the technical word is autolysis. So it undergoes wow. autolysis, mm. and this is what builds the uh, builds all these fantastic uh, flavors. Yeah. Now, am I right in There's thinking no there is no real shortcut? There's no shortcut to doing it. It's just time. Well, that, that, that's what was, that leads me on to my next question: Is that uh, am I right in thinking that in some of the champagne houses in France, you have a, a man go along the racks of bottles of wine, literally turning them every day or every week, or? A massive amount of labour goes into making champagne, and that's what makes it so much more expensive than just a regular bottle of wine. That is true, and it's what the way that we do it here, and that turning is what is called riddling. Okay. And the riddling part of the process is um, the the end of ageing, and what and, and to remove the yeast, we've got to get the yeast um, down onto the um, onto the beer caps. So the closure at that point is a like a crown cap, a beer cap, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, and riddling riddling actually only takes twenty one days. Okay, mm-hmm. so that's the very so end of the process. These, these, right at the end, but these guys are probably doing it on a um, you know on the basis that, that is their job. So every day they will be riddling. But it will be different wines. The each wine only takes twenty one days to um, to get the yeast ready to be removed. Mm, absolutely fascinating, uh, Tim. Yeah, uh, yeah well, many well, a number of years ago, I came to one of your your tasting events at, uh, at your headquarters there, and I think you were chatting about distilling. Is that something you've you've ventured into? I know you were talking about it. Um, is it something you you'd like to have a go at? Yeah, so I've got, well, it was not me directly, but I've got a friend who's got a distillery and we did have a small batch of brandy made, which mm-hmm. is um, which is wine, which is that wine, which is then distilled and aged in oak for um, three years and a day. So it's, a, again, a very long process. Um, and um, yeah, that, that came and went. Um, that, w- that was very successful. And um, we are kind of at the moment in the in the stage of trying to um, get enough spirit, um, distilled spirit, maybe to do some gin. So that might be something that happens for us in the um, not too distant future. But every year we only we only do a re- we only send off a very small amount. So it, it's going to take a while for us to get commercially viable um, size to have a decent. A decent batch. 
Okay. Mm. If you see what I mean. Yeah, 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 absolutely. But that sounds like yeah. a good project. But yeah, so it's still, it's yeah. still there. Yep. Still interested in it. Um, mm. Still think, um, you know, still think that it is um, viable to do. A, uh, an avenue for mm. Shaper One State to take. Um, it, but it's just that um, with our level of production, we, we don't have a lot spare. For sure, yeah. From the winemaking. Yeah. That leaves me on to one of the other questions that I've always interested me if you wanted to create sort of i'm going to say a sensible amount of wine for the average household uh, <laughs> now what's that that's I, a good question a good <laughs> so, uh, i'm yeah. going to say 50 bottles a year um does that keep us under uh, into in the nhs guidelines i don't know um but uh, anyway yeah uh, if one, you wanted one to, a week yeah if we were going to make 50 bottles of wine um how many vines do you actually need i mean you've got in excess of five thousand down there so obviously you're clearly making a lot more yeah. than 50 bottles a year but have you ever thought about yeah. that as an equi- uh, a sort of calculation um let's say that well to keep it simple math yeah i guess um growing them like we do in a field rather than say against the wall or on a pergola we we are looking at hopefully maybe getting about two kilos per vine right okay and two kilos two kilos um will probably produce depending on which sort of wine getting on for two bottles okay, okay. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Mm. so so you could you could you could scale up from there um, yeah, as yeah. to what your what your household um uh, consumption <laughs> that's quite a few vines <laughs> so we need a, a, a reasonable yeah. patch of land for that, that, that's interesting brilliant good stuff thank you for that it's not, it's not, that, that kind of bucket math but um it's mm. probably not too far off mm. um, tim you we were just chatting about sort of global warming and obviously how that affects our crops and things but so uh, what would be what, what would you describe your perfect growing season to get your best uh, crop of, of, of grapes uh, down at the uh, the vineyard per- perfect Perfect season um, would be um, a uh, cold, dry winter. Okay. To allow them allow them to uh, go really uh, really dormant, um, mm-hmm. and then um, springtime. Most importantly, um, no frost because uh, they're really susceptible to frost. Um, April to May, April May time. Yeah. And then uh, and then a nice uh, hot hot dry summer. And uh, a dry autumn when we are harvesting. Well, that's Simple as that. Indeed. Yeah. So, but we don't ask for too much, really. No, no. I was going to say, just have a have a word with the, the Met Office and uh, yeah, book book your yeah. uh, your weather in. Yeah, that's good. That's that's yeah. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. And earlier you told us a little bit about the fact you the soil it starts as chalk and moves into our best quality Buckinghamshire clay. Can you grow vines on? any soil or I mean, from my memory chalk is a sort of the best vineyards are, have lots of chalk in their soil is that right and can you grow it on a peat yeah bog? well i mean it's not not really, no so the the one the one the one thing that all vines um need is pre-draining soil okay mm-hmm. yeah um they do not like to have wet feet um so yeah, whether it be chalk, limestone, which is pretty much the, the same sort of thing, um, uh, light soils uh, are fa- favourable, I guess. Um, but around the world, not so much in England, I guess you can grow on heavier clay soils. Um, there's some famous sites, but that is where you know you get in the heat, so they warm up and probably dry out a little bit. Um, Right. Whereas a really heavy heavy soil in the UK would not really be good because you know we're kind of cold and wet anyway, and then for the soil to be cold and wet just just wouldn't work very well. Okay, so so long as you've got yeah. say a sandy loam or a relatively light soil, it might be worth giving it yeah. a go. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So t- Tim, the, the training of your, your grapevines obviously uh, always looks. Well, it looks it always looks quite complex. Um, am I right in thinking, or is it is it fairly straightforward sort of process um, from from planting a, uh, you know, a, a young uh, grapevine? What was the process to to get them in the the right sort of fruiting shape? Well, I guess first couple of years, um, it really is all about the roots. You know, to establish mm. a vineyard, um, 
you do not want to compromise the long-term um, uh, asset that you've got there by trying to crop it too early. Um, okay. So the first few years are all about encouraging the roots, and typically that also means that we prune it right back, maybe back down to uh, a couple of buds. Um, in the third or fourth year, depending on how it's going, that is when we look to get a bit of structure, um, creating the permanent part of the plant, which is the trunk. Um, and then from there, the way that we do it, and to be fair, probably most vineyards in England um, use this system called GEO. Um, it's a replacement cane system. So what we need to do is uh, grow a cane, mm -hmm. which will then, in, in one year, which will then become the fruiting wood the following year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and every year we remove that and grow another one and replace it. Right. Um, and once you get into the swing of it, it is actually pretty straightforward. When would you prune out the old wood to leave the, the new wood? What sort of time frame would, would that happen? Win winter time. Winter, so it's winter pruning. Okay. Win winter, winter pruning is by far the single biggest job that we do for the entire year. Um, right. So we've now got way, well over 10,000 vines, <laughs> and um, it, it, it basically means a pair of secateurs and just working, working up and down up and down the lines um, from end of November to um, sometime end of Feb, beginning of March. So, yeah, wow. it, it, it produces a lot of wood mm -hmm. um, and it keeps me very occupied all winter. Obviously, the days are a little bit shorter. Sure, but, yeah, um, yeah um, it, it's the biggest job of the year and nobody really sees it because we don't have visitors at that time of year. <laughs> no, <laughs> but it has to be done. I mean, yeah, uh, looking at it's the... it's got to be done. It has. Tim, yep. the, the, the wood colour, um, obviously, is the old... Is, is it quite easy to differentiate the old wood with the new wood? Because I know a lot of... When I'm, I, grow, I grow a grapevine at home and I have, have to look quite... <laughs> I have to study it with scrutiny to differentiate. Obviously, it becomes sort of a, I suppose, a skill, doesn't it, once you've, you've, you're going to the swing of pruning? Yeah. Well, um, the, the, like, it, like this year's wood, um, by the time we get into pruning, should have lignified, i.e. Mm -hmm. gone from green to brown and turned into proper hard wood. So yeah. you should be able to... Um, you should be able to um, uh, determine it from mm -hmm. from that because the you know the leaves have gone the fruit have gone and all we've got when we're pruning is a like a, a shrub that that's in winter mode do you know what I mean it yeah. just looks yeah. like a bear a bear tree in a way mm -hmm. um, but yeah yeah I've, yeah it yeah it's one of those things where um, I guess um, it, it's just practice you, you you just once you once you see it it's it's relatively easy, uh, but I'm the same with apples. You know, I look at an apple tree and I haven't got a clue. Um, I bought vines probably now that I've done it for more than 10 years, and you that's a lot of vines I've pruned. Um, <laughs> you, you kind of almost do it by yeah, second nature, yeah, you know, yeah, you just all, you do it automatically. Sure. Um, and can I ask, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, are they like um, sort of oak trees that a vine's going to last you three, four, five hundred years? I mean, what, what's the lifespan of a, a vine? Um, potentially, and the big but is uh, it, that would be if they were on their own roots. Ah, they're grafted then, are they? How, however, however, all vines really in Europe are on graf grafted uh, or they're grafted onto American rootstock. Yeah, okay. and and a vine, the grafted vine is likely to be viable for about forty or fifty years. Okay. Okay, so you should get a good few crops off them then. But big difference, yeah, big difference in in the age, but still a long time. Whichever way you look at it, it's still a long time. And, and being grafted, does that improve its vigor, or is it is it for disease? What's the main reason for for putting it on some on a rootstock, uh, Tim? Yeah, the main the main reason is um, because of this louse called phylloxia. Uh, phylloxia chomped its way through the European vineyards back in the 1800s okay. um, and the grafting is because it came from America and uh, in, in America there are um, the phylloxia resistant um, vines so we use, we use them to um, make sure that phylloxia really cannot become a problem again mm. but within that um, there is still then selection that can be made because you've got um, 
you've got, like you say, vigor, um, water, um, pH, all of these things can be determined by rootstock these days. Mm, that's good. So if you've got a particularly chalky bit of soil that's very dry, there will be a probably a different rootstock for that than if you were, like you said earlier, growing on clay. Mm, that's interesting. So a bit yeah. like the apple trees that we sell, the old MM yeah, yeah. 106 yeah, or uh, <laughs> yeah, whatever you want. There's a huge... There's a huge selection of rootstock, and they've all got numbers. Rather, well, no, they don't all have, but most of them got numbers, not names. Yeah. Excellent. And uh, can you give us a clue as to what's a good English rootstock uh, or, or one for the standard sort of Bacchus? What what would you be looking for on that? The the most common rootstock used in England is um, what's called SO4. Okay. It's a good all rounder, really. Um, yeah. 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 So most of most vines in England are grown on SO4. Okay, thank you very much. Mm. And um, Tim, what sort of other issues have you had to contend when you've been growing your your grapes? I mean, you know, pest diseases. Um, you know, I'm sure I'm sure there are a lot of potential um, downfalls along the way. But uh, you, I suppose you've got to be maybe prepared. I suppose you know, prevention is better than cure. Well, yeah. Um, when when you list it out, it's pretty scary. But there are many perils. Um, mm. Obviously. The first, the first one, I guess, will be to do with the weather. Mm-hmm. Um, the um, issues with, like I said earlier, frost in May, April, May time, hail can be potentially a big problem. Wet, uh, I, i.e., rain. Um, all of these sort of, uh, all of these things um, are, are not good. Then we've got all the fungal diseases potentially, um, downy mildew, powdery mildew, botrytis. So they they can be an issue again related to the weather because the weather promotes them. Uh, on top of that, we've then got all the uh, vineyard friends, like I mentioned earlier, that are out there. So um, <laughs> everything <dear>. really <laughs> likes to likes to likes to ripe grapes. Yep. Um, you know, when grapes are ripe, we've got foxes, badgers, birds, whatever really out there, <laughs> um, and then insects. Not very many insect pests, but what could be a problem so we're quite fortunate in the uk that insects are not um a problem like they are in other parts of the world so um yeah Mm. there are um lots of um lots of potential things that could uh, knock us back a little bit sounds um, like you have a perfect easy life down there tim (laughs) nothing to worry about at all is there yeah Yeah. gosh wow yeah 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 Uh, but you know Again, not pertinent to me here at Gorkot. Um, it doesn't really matter where you grow grapes in the world. All of these things are potentially um, a, 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 a problem and will impact on the yield. Mm. That's it. And I guess when you're, I, mean, I know as a, a student, one of the jobs you could always go and do was become a, a grape picker over in France and help out with the grape pricking there I, I guess when you come to actually harvesting the grapes you've got a if you've got 10,000 vines you've got an awful lot of grapes to be picking yep is it easy to get the workforce to help you I mean I guess you're not doing it all by yourself are you no um harvest time yeah we um we we need lots of uh, pairs of hands to help and we have been really really fortunate and we have got a, a really good Cool, really good group of people who come along and help us do it on a like volunteer basis. Right. Um, some people come every year. Um, some people come from a long way away, London or wherever. Um, and yeah, we are very lucky that we've got a great group of uh, people that just want to get involved. Uh, that might just be for a morning or a, or a day. Um, some people come every ticking day and it's, and it's one of those things where it's up to them. We kind of pay in food and wine. So everybody goes home with a bottle of wine. Everybody gets fed. And then um, we have like a big harvest festival. But we do it the following spring stroke summer. Because at harvest time, when we get into the end of October, November, it's just a bit too cold and grotty. So we, mm. we, we invite anybody who's helped us to come, come back and, uh, and try the vintage that they have helped to and help to to bring in. Mm. That's great. Yeah. That's, a, that's yeah. a nice way yeah. to do yeah. it. Yeah. 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 Nice community yeah. spirit, I yeah. suspect, as well. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, we're really fortunate. I, I must say we are really fortunate. 
And with regards to harvesting the grapes once you've picked them, is there still a tradition of sort of taking your socks off, giving your feet a good wash and jumping in the uh, barrel and uh, crushing them? Or are there different (laughs) ways of doing it these days? Yeah, there might be, but not here. We (laughs) use a big commercial wine press. Oh, right. Okay. Uh, Yeah, holds about two tons of grapes. So like a great big skip full of grapes. And uh, I guess that is the more modern way of doing it. But that's not to say that people um, don't do it with their feet um, somewhere around the world. I'm sure they do. Um, (laughs) Well, that was the traditional uh, way of doing it, wasn't it? it? That's not how we do it at Scorecott. Excellent. So you don't have a cheesy favour to your wines then? <laughs> no, 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 no. Good stuff. No. I'm pleased to hear it. Um, I, did, I did hear of a vineyard, I can't remember where, that actually um, sell that as an experience day. So people can um, spend mm. a lot of money to, um, like say, jump in a barrel with some grapes and, uh, oh. and, uh, and, and, and make their own wine like mm. that. So, mm. um, well. Yes, yeah, always, an, always an opportunity somewhere. <laughs> <Indeed>. <laughs> Tim, you've you've had your your wines uh, have had amazing success over the last few years, um, which you must be proud of. Any any particular highlights? Um, in terms of um, like competition wins, yeah, and, wins um, and yeah, re- accolades, reviews yeah. and yeah. reviews, yeah. accolades mm-hmm. and things like that. Yeah, yeah. So um, I guess we have been fairly successful, won medals and trophies, local, national international um so that's all very nice mm. um but probably the one that stands out has been the the nicest was a couple of years ago uh, an american guy called robert parker now robert parker is really famous in the world of wine he came up with the 100 point system so aimed at aimed at americans really and he goes around the world scoring wines out of 100 and and that just makes it easy to um, make comparisons when you're when you're buying wine, and he his reputation is that um, he's known to be the man that can either make or break a chateau. He, you know, he's that he's that influ- influential. Um, wow. And a couple of years ago, when he did his one and only review on English wine, we uh, one of our wines, our rosé, our sparkling rosé, scored ninety one points, and that was the highest in the English review. Um, and it, it, if you look at all the champagnes that it's tasted over the years, which is tens of thousands, very few get more than 91 points. So so for me, as a little kind of um, peasant bumpkin farmer in North Fork, um, <laughs> that, that is probably um, the, yeah. nicest, the nicest thing that has happened from that point of view because it is proper recognition from mm. within the industry. It's a brilliant accolade. It's a bit of me. Yeah, so we were we were very really pleased with that. That's great. Yeah, that's yeah. our vintage rosé. Yeah. Cool, good stuff. And other than all the grapes for wine, what else are you growing? Any for eating? I mean, do you make? I guess in England it's a bit cold for making raisins, but is it? Do we have a good climate for growing sort of edible grapes and seedless ones? Maybe. No. Um, not that I know of. <laughs> certainly, uh, certainly, we do not here at Gorecourt, other than to say that if you are looking for a versatile variety that does grow here in the UK, Bacchus is not only really nice for making wine, right. but it also tastes nice. Yeah. Okay. So, so you, you can... wouldn't, it wouldn't be, it would not be considered to be like a table grape or an eating grape, um, right. but um, we, we do eat quite a lot of them during harvest time. Let's yeah. put it that way. Yeah, and, it, and it's a variety we we do sell as a as a growing grape at the, at the garden centre. So yeah, I, yeah I've yeah. seen it yeah. many, in, many times around yeah. the garden centre, yeah. but I always thought we grew it, we sold it for winemakers. Well, but that's good. So it's a dual yeah. purpose, a dual purpose. purpose variety. Yeah. It is dual purpose. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, excellent, good yeah. stuff. And now, interesting, you're talking about red wines earlier and your Pinot Noir. I know there's a vineyard down in Gloucestershire that has. Um, some red wine, red red wine grapes, and they grow all their grapes in tunnels. And I understood that the reason for that was because they needed the heat. But is is that not actually sort of always necessary? You can grow a red red wine grape in the UK without growing it indoors or under shelter, should I say? Probably, yeah. Ninety nine point nine percent will be grown outdoors. 
I I think I might know the one that you're that you're talking about, uh, and it is pretty unusual. Um, I I don't know of any others in the UK. So out Excellent. of those, you know, nearly a thousand sites, we've got four thousand hectares of vines in the UK, I believe, at the moment, and um, there's probably maybe one hectare that's grown under. Okay, so if you want to grow a red a red wine grape, you can do it without yeah, protection. Just yeah. a greenhouse, and <laughs> you can grow them outside. That's really helpful to know. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so Tim, what's coming up next on on the vineyard? I suppose it is all going to be about uh, harvesting, but uh, anything further afoot? Yeah. So we are now planning for our harvest. That should begin round about the end of September through October. Um, maybe finish end of October um, it really depends on what happens with the ne- the weather mm-hmm. in the next few weeks and then after that it's really all about our Christmas we'll be uh, also thinking about our little Christmas shop we open uh, a little Christmas shop with you know just for the run up to Christmas mm-hmm. um, and of course um, we oh I probably if invited we'll be out and about yeah out and about um, doing tastings like you know, the garden centre, Buckingham Garden Centre. So, mm. yeah, that is that is what um, that is what's coming up for us for the rest of the year. So, I suppose Christmas is your busy selling time, is it? You sell the most wine in Christmas. Uh, well, certainly summer, summer and Christmas. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, uh, not not so much January, February. <laughs> yeah, our sales <laughs> die off there as well. Yeah. Surprisingly, yeah. That, that's it. Brilliant. Yeah, stuff. yeah, and. Coming towards the end of the, the show now, Tim, one of the favourite questions we always have is, if you're shipwrecked on a desert island, what plant or tool are you going to take with you? So, yeah, I think that I would have to say I would have to have a, a grape vine and a grape press okay. to make okay. my wine. Yeah. So you really don't like using your feet for <laughs> making the wine then, do you? <laughs> That's good. Excellent. And any particular grape variety you'd take? Now, this is a English desert island. Having mentioned it several times, I think it's probably going to be Bacchus mm-hmm. as the number one. And uh, if that's not available, Pinot Noir. Okay. Oh, oh, that's right. Oh, right. Choice too. Yeah. Great yeah. stuff. Oh, that sounds that sounds a really They're good. My two yeah. They're my two favourites. Yeah. No, it'd be a really good desert island for sure with uh, with the grapes, Greg. And and Tim, we we do like to ask for a a, a gardening related or wine related sort of joke or a tale, perhaps from your work in the in the wine world. You'd like to to share with us. What do you call the 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 man at the party who is the life and soul? Ooh, I don't know, Tim. What do you call the man at the party, the life and soul? The fun guy. Okay. Oh, there you go. Well, there. <laughs> wasn't expecting that. That's great. That's, 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 that's vintage. That's there's, vintage. Got be a cut, there's got to be a cut, but that is a, a pretty rubbish check. <laughs> no, it's good. Yep. No, it's good. We it's like good. the one-liners. They're always, yep. they, no. they, they always get a good good laugh. <laughs> it's like definitely a Christmas cracker joke. Badly told as well. Bad, badly told. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, Tim, well, thank you very much for your time today. It's been a great uh, delight to chat to you. Yeah, lovely. Thank you very much, Tim. Yeah, no, brilliant. Thanks a lot. Today's show was brought to you by Buckingham Garden Centre and Nurseries. The show was hosted by Chris Day and Peter Brown. The show was produced by Peter Brown. And our thanks to Chilton Music Therapy for providing the music. Thanks for listening. At Chilton Music Therapy, we want everyone to know the difference that music can make in their lives. From parents and their premature babies in hospital to grandparents with dementia. We provide music therapy and community music services to people of all ages and needs across England. We work both digitally and in person in people's homes, care homes, schools, hospitals and hospices. Find out more at chilternmusictherapy.co.uk.